Hi everyone, welcome to Mathematically Inclined. I am Neha, your math mentor. Today we will be beginning with chapter 2, Inverse Trigonometric Functions. And this video is part 1 of the 8 upcoming videos in the same chapter. Likewise, I have divided the entire course into topic wise videos which I will be uploading in due course. Now please remember all these videos would be available for free. So like, share and most importantly subscribe as it will keep me motivated to work on more content. Dual logic behind starting with chapter 2 before chapter 1. First, it is easier to grasp. Secondly, it gives a perfect head start to calculus which is next on our agenda. Do I have to answer that? It carries 44 marks of your syllabus. Now before I begin with this chapter, in case you haven't seen my previous video which described the entire course structure design of the question paper for class 12th, I would be leaving the link for the same in the description box below. So ensure to do that. So now let's get started and see how we are going to proceed with this chapter. Although there would be few concepts which might be required from chapter 1, but do not worry as I'll be explaining everything as we move along. Now let's dive straight into today's agenda. In today's video, we would be discussing the following. First, what is inverse of a function? Second, what are the types of functions? Third, condition for inverse of a function to exist. Fourth, principal value branch for all the inverse trigonometric functions. And lastly, what is the graphical connection between a trigonometric function and its inverse? So let's get started. I have highlighted two key words of the chapter which are inverse and functions. So let us first of all see what is inverse of a function. If you have a function which is moving from set A to set B such that it is uniquely defined as f of x is equal to y and we land into a situation where another function which is moving from set B to set A. So in short, the domain and the range have been switched. If such a function can exist such that g of y is equal to x, then in that case g is the same as f inverse. In short, to illustrate the same, if I am saying f of 1 is equal to 2 for a certain function, then if the inverse of the function exists, in that case, g of 2 is equal to 1. Or in other words, if I take inverse of this 2, it gets me back to the element 1. So now, as we proceed with the chapter, we would see what are the types of functions for which the inverse exists and what is the exact condition for them to exist. four types that we would be discussing in today's lecture that is one one function many to one function onto function and into function so let's see what we understand by the one one function now if we consider a function by which we mean that all elements of the first set should be uniquely connected to some element in b let's say here i connect one with c in set b so this clearly tells us that f of 1 is equal to c now by 1 to 1 function we mean that if i take the next element which is 2 i cannot connect it with c it should be uniquely connected to some other member let's say e likewise when i consider the third element here it has to move on to some other element in set b so as we you know try to put it in our simple language one to one means for every one element 
there is an image for the second element it goes to a different image so one to one correspondence let's talk of what we mean by many to one function it's as simple as that if a function is not one to one then it's many to one you would have seen your classroom structure where you have one teacher talking to many of you so it's like many to one correspondence let's try to build upon what do we understand by an onto or a subjective function in class 11th you would have done this that when you connect a function from set a to set b then in general you say that range is a subset of its codomain by this i mean just in case i start connecting the members here in this situation the members a b c and e they formulate the range for this function and the entire set b is the codomain thus range is a subset of codomain but hey what happens when range exactly becomes equal to the codomain that means had there been let's say no element d in this case range is exactly equal to its codomain so in short a function is said to be onto when there is no extra element left in set b talking of the into function the situation that we discussed earlier where range was a subset of codomain was an example of an into function now let's see how do we use all these types to get the condition for inverse of a function to exist if a function is one to one and or two simultaneously that means it is injective and surjective both such a function is said to be a bijective function and inverse for such a function will exist i call this function as f of x then in this case f of 0 is 0 f of pi is 0 f of 2 pi is 0 so on and so forth so if i try taking the inverse for such a function what do i get we get f inverse 0 giving multiple values which is not even a function so 1 1 becomes important likewise if i do not take the function to be onto that means if i define sin x in its natural way that means if my codomain stays r then in that case if i pick up this element 2 from the codomain what is the pre image what is the pre image of sin inverse 2 nothing it does not exist once again if an element cannot have an image how could it even be a function that's why we conclude for a function to have its inverse it has to be 1 1 and 1 2 simultaneously look at the graph of the cos function which is once again moving from r to r to see it is not 1 1 as if we take an example it is getting zero at multiple points okay so we have to restrict its domain likewise we have to restrict its codomain as well otherwise we would not get the function to be onto so we select one of the intervals 0 to pi which makes your function one to one likewise the codomain gets restricted to minus 1 to 1 as you see the function once again oscillating between minus 1 and 1 so this function is bijective so the inverse for cos can now exist cos inverse x 
once again this switching happens move from minus 1 to 1 to 0 to pi so minus 1 comma 1 becomes the domain of cos inverse function and 0 to pi becomes the PVB which we discussed principal value branch now let's try to see through the principal value branch table as to what would be the domain and the principal value branch for each of the trigonometric functions this question must be haunting you by now as to how would you remember this principal value branch table well i've got you covered there is a simple trick just have a look at this quadrant table you know all the quadrants one two three and four now try to just correlate this to the table which you have to remember you can clearly see none of the principal value branch lies in the third quadrant so that is simply out of our bounds now just remember as a combination sine inverse x cosecant inverse x and tan inverse x work on the similar branch that means covers first and fourth quadrant if you try to look at the table you would understand what i mean to say that is it you just have to remember one combination because the remaining three functions which are precisely cos inverse x secant inverse x and cot inverse x would automatically lie in the first and second quadrants that is 0 to 5 found that easy try it on your own let's try and see this through our example y is equal to sin x if you look at the graph of y is equal to sin x please note that i have taken the graph only according to the principal value branch that means this point has the coordinates pi by 2 comma 1 this one would talk of the coordinates minus pi by 2 comma minus 1 2. now how would this graph act when it becomes sine inverse of x we expect the point to occur as 1 comma pi by 2 before we do that please see this time your x axis has been replaced with the older y axis so this would have the coordinates minus 1 0 and 1 and this one automatically becomes pi by 2 and minus pi by 2 so as i was saying pi by 2 comma 1 if that belongs to sin x then 1 comma pi by 2 would belong to sin inverse x likewise minus 1 comma minus pi by 2 would lie over here so the graph that you can expect this time would be this if you try putting these two graphs together you would see that they are just mirror images of each other above the line y equal to x following slides would show you the connection between cos x cos inverse x tan x tan inverse x and similarly the remaining three functions please note i am not deliberately plotting each of the graphs here as sketching of these graphs is not included in your class 12 syllabus however one has to understand the structure for understanding this further that's it we have discussed all the topics which we had in our mind for today if you found the video useful please give it a like share and once again i'm urging you to subscribe to my channel and in the next video i'll meet you with a lot of questions on principal value branch of a function as well as finding domain of inverse trigonometric functions so until then bye bye